to correct something because I was announcing him all the time as a surprise mod. But this is Jeroen, and his nickname is Sprite, and his website is Sprite Mods. So this is Sprite, aka Jeroen, or the other way around. He's going to talk about a very cool hack or cheat, what he did, and it's very cool. So, may I have a big hand for Jeroen. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, as, uh, well, I think you already uh, took my very first slide. I am uh, Jeroen Domburg, uh, also known as Sprite. The TM is silent. Um, and um, uh, I have a, web a website where I uh, project a lot of documents uh, and all my... Oh, let's not drop that. <laughs> Uh, with all my hacking and, and hardware development and software development, etc. And uh, well, uh, I'd like to show you one of my uh, my projects. Um, well, first of all, this is about retro computing, and well, most of you will probably know what retro computing is. But for those who who, who don't, according to Wikipedia, retro computing is the use of older computer hardware in, and software in modern times. And of course, the, 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 the standard um, uh, display of retro computing, uh, something which is actually happening here, is playing old games. Uh, for example, one of, one of my favorites uh, from the past, uh, Keen. But it's actually more than that. Uh, for example, it's also uh, taking old hardware and trying to teach it new tricks. Uh, for example, the Commodore 64 um, uh, scene is, is, is pretty good at that. And um, um, there there actually are still new methods being invented to, to push the, the, the hardware to make it do extra interesting stuff, to, to, to figure out bugs and work around them or, or actually use them for something cool. And it's, 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 it's all really cool. The problem is that if you are just a programmer and you say, okay, I want to take an ancient machine and, and I want to do all kinds of cool stuff on it, it's hard. Uh, you got to know all kinds of things, like for example, 8-bit assembly with a non-orthogonal um, uh, uh, instruction set. Hell, you, you got to know assembly. You have a limited CPU. Most of the things don't even reach two or three me megahertz. You have all kinds of weird bugs. You've got uh, uh, weird stuff you got to do to just get a picture on, on screen, etc. And while it's all very rewarding in its own sense, because um, of course that, 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 that there is a certain reward in, in getting limited on all sides and then just breaching those limits, it's also something not everyone wants to do. There's another way. You cheat. Okay. Well, how do we cheat? Well, first of all, we need a target. And um, the people who sat around there probably have noticed uh, um, a nice uh, black box, which also is here now, which is the Vectrex. And um, uh, the, 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 the Vectrex is a, a uh, well, uh, it's a pretty sweet machine. Um, it stems from 1982. Um, it has a uh, Motorola 6809 uh, processor running at a whopping, like in really fast, one and a half megahertz. Um, it has a whole K of RAM and it actually has 8K of ROM. And actually half of that is a game you get for free with it. So that's awesome. Um, that was, um, also it has got an AI38 uh, whatever for sound. It's basically the same chip that's in the MSX. It, it, it's, a, it's a nice three channel bleepy thing. You can get a pretty nice sound out of it. Um, and it also has a really cool analog joystick actually. If you thought uh, uh, the PlayStation and Xbox were the, the, the first, nope, this one actually has a fully functional and pretty okay uh, analog joystick. And of course it's a Vectrack because it has a monochrome vector monitor instead of uh, just connecting it to the, to the, to, to the television and, and doing stuff uh, there. Why is, why is a vector monitor so interesting? Well, um, uh, here you see the difference. Normally a television works by just, um, uh, it has a certain amount of lines and, and, and it just scans them every time over and over again. And it just draws pixels while scanning the lines. That's, that's, that's how a television works. And you get really blocky graphics, especially in the first uh, 
consoles. On the other hand, you have the vector monitor, and instead of, of, of going only left to right, left to right, etc., you can you can take the beam and just move it anywhere you want. Um, and because the um, video hardware in the Vectrex actually is mostly analog, you get really crisp lines without the, the, the staircase effect you have when you try to draw lines on a, uh, on a raster gra graphics uh, thing. So, okay, back to the Vectrex. Uh, just to give you an indication of um, uh, how old this thing is and what you can expect uh, from it, it's part of the uh, second generation of video game uh, consoles. Uh, it's the, it's the um, uh, bit that started with the uh, Atari 2600, uh, which you probably all know. Uh, it also encompasses the Intellivision, the ColecoVision and the Atari uh, 5200. And, um, well, of course, the Vectrex. And unfortunately, it all ended a, a, a year later because of the big video game crash of 1983. You probably have heard of uh, Atari uh, dumping heaps and heaps of ET cartridges into a l landfill because they couldn't se sell any of them. And a few, a few years later, in which there were very, very few console re releases, um, uh, the, the third generation of video game consoles started with the Nintendo Entertainment System. So the Vectrex actually predates the, the Nintendo Entertainment System. Okay, just to show you, an, uh, uh, just just to give you an indication of how uh, how, how all those uh, consoles look like. I've uh, um, uh, ripped a few screenshots of the internet. For example, this is the Atari 2600 with a um, uh, pitfall display, which is a pretty nice uh, game and it's really colorful, etc., for an Atari uh, 2600. Then you've got the Intellivision and you can see that the display is more complex and you've got more colors and more shapes, etc. Uh, also, the Atari 5200, which, uh, uh, both the, uh, uh, yeah, which, which came out in the same year as the Vectrex. And finally, uh, you have the Vectrex, and just to show you um, uh, what it can do, I will, uh, I've recorded myself playing a few games, uh, pretty badly. <laughs> and I'll, oh, I'll try to show you now, if I can get this thing full screen. Sorry for the crappy sound, this is not an emulator, this is the actual Vectrex I'm, I'm recording. Okay, this is the built-in game, uh, Mindstorm, uh, which is uh, actually a pretty, pretty good game for a game you get free. Uh, it's basically an, uh, an asteroid clone. You get all kinds of mines that get pop into the image, then you gotta shoot them all. And as you can see, it can get pretty frantic and well. So this is Scramble, this is uh, I think a game that's ported from another console, but this is actually a very good port. Uh, according to the internet, this is one of the best uh, uh, ports um, of, of Scramble that was made. Sorry, sound cuts out here. Uh, basically, you got to shoot everything and also make sure that, uh, that um, uh, you still have enough uh, fuel to, to, uh, to keep flying. Uh, this is Badlam, which is um, actually, um, uh, you also had vector monitors in arcades, and I think this is one of the uh, games they licensed from Cinematronics, I think, who made uh, big uh, vector arcade games. And um, I've been told it's a pretty good port, I've never played the original. So Berserk, um, some of you may know this game because it has been ported to well, uh, a hell of a lot of, of uh, home consoles, um, and it's basically uh, you're in a maze with electrified sensors. You gotta shoot the robots, or you gotta wait until they're stupid enough to walk into the electrified fans themselves. Uh, Hyper Chase, which is actually pretty nice um, uh, because it uses the vector capability to do uh, pseudo 3D um, uh, graphics, uh, pseudo 3D. Um, this is actually um, uh, one of the first racer games that came out. I think this actually was a release title. There are more interesting um, uh, games which actually have real curving um, uh, roads. But I thought I'd show this one. Finally Spike. This is a, a bit later cartridge and it's interesting because... It has digitized sounds, which is pretty nice. I mean, I think the cartridge is like 8K or something, so... 
And it's a, it's a platformer. I think it's the only platformer for the, uh, for the Tech Tracks game. It's pretty nice. Um, unfortunately, I suck there. <laughs> so, okay, now you, have, now you have an idea of how it all looks like. Now I gotta find my mouse again. It's there. Okay, um, so, um, well, first of all, I need something to, um, uh, to actually allow the Vectrex to execute my programs. And the standard way of doing it is making a flash cartridge, which is basically a cartridge you can program, then uh, plug into the Vectrex, and then turn on the Vectrex, and it will run whatever you put on it. Usually uh, pirated games, well, pirated, that's a bit hard, actually, because all the release titles have been released into the public domain. Um, okay, so uh, what's in a normal card then? Well, a normal card is really, really simple. It's basically a, a piece of print, a printed circuit board with a ROM chip on it. That's all. Uh, there's, there's nothing more needed than that. No, no weird protection chips, no weird mappers, no weird anything. Um, for those of you who don't know how a ROM chip works, this is the uh, schematic of, well, actually an EEPROM. And it's pretty simple, it's just a big lookup table. Um, uh, 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 a program consists of a bunch of 8-bit um, 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 uh, uh, bytes. And uh, what you basically do is you feed the address of the byte you want into the A um, uh, lines. In this case you have got 11 of them, uh, uh, or sorry, actually 12 of them, um, uh, making a 4K of, of, uh, of, of bytes, so 4K bytes. And if you do that on the, uh, on the other side, on, on the queue outputs, the, the byte you addressed will automatically um, uh, come out after actually a little while because those things are not infinitely um, quick. And there's also a, in, in the bottom a small input and if you make that high, the ROM will act like it doesn't exist, so it won't output anything. That's pretty handy because uh, the queue uh, um, 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 lines also get driven by, for example, the RAM and the peripherals. So um, if the cartridge isn't addressed, you can use that to keep it quiet. Okay, so, uh, well, this is how you would go uh, if you wanted to have a reprogrammable repro card. This is uh, actually a prototype of a real Vectrex game. And as you see, it's not that much different. It's just an EEPROM, uh, which is basically a ROM with a uh, window in it, and you can uh, put it under an ultraviolet lamp to erase it and then reprogram it. And um, yeah, that's stuck on a cartridge, and, and they basically use this, this to burn their test programs, uh, stick it on a cartridge, plug it in the, the, the Vectrex, and see if it worked. Um, well, of course, I can also do this, and well, I already have this Vectrex uh, um, uh, for, for a few years, and I uh, didn't actually get a cartridge with it, so I actually needed to make my own flashcards to do that, and well, this is my, my attempt. Um, <laughs> It's not the best piece of PCB designing I ever did, but um, uh, well, what you basically see here, or rather what you don't see here, is uh, there's a big uh, flash EEPROM chip uh, underneath here, uh, which is connected exactly um, uh, in the same fashion as the ROM chip is on a normal cartridge. But it's actually a bit bigger than that. It has more address lines than, than um, uh, a normal cartridge. So you have these dip switches, um, which you can then use to um, choose which part of the bigger flash ROM is shown to the Vectrex. So what you do is basically you t take multiple games, you stack them together, you burn them inside your big flash EEPROM, and then you can use the dip switches to select which, which game you, you, you get to choose. So that's a really bare bones but working uh, um, uh, flash uh, cartridge. And this is actually something that has been done many, many times. Uh, if, you, if you take any, um, uh, well, recently old console, uh, um, uh, check out the uh, flash cartridges that have been homebrewn for it, um, chances are large you see a dip switch on there to uh, select the game because they all work the, the same way. Uh, of course, you can make uh, flash cartridges that are more advanced, but still work in the same way. For example, this is one that looks a hell of a lot better. Um, it actually has two uh, flash EEPROMs because you can store m more, more games then. Uh, those are those two. And uh, it also has a bit of RAM because some cartridges have um, uh, more uh, uh, RAM on, on them. 
and it uses a bit of programmable logic here. And what the programmable logic thing basically is, is just um, a bunch of software dip switches. What happens is that uh, as soon as you plug it in, all the dip switches are on zero, and the thing will load the very first um, uh, cartridge. And the very first cartridge is a menu cartridge. It's just a nice menu you can, you can use to choose which game you want. Um, then the menu cartridge will tell the card, okay, um, uh, I, I want you to reset the, 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 the Vectrex, or it will do it by itself. Uh, and um, uh, uh, when that's happened, I want you to set the virtual dip switches to this certain number. And, um, uh, uh, well, this chip will do that, and, and you'll see the, the, um, uh, the game you've chosen. So, and, and basically a hell of a lot of, of, of uh, um, flashcards where you can use a menu to, to um, choose your game work this way. Of course, this is all interesting, but as you saw, uh, those are a hell of a lot of chips and you needed to make a different um, um, uh, PCB and you need to solder a lot and you also need to um, uh, write VHDL, which is a bit harder than C. And you don't really get much more than you would get when you just put a dip switch in it. So is there a way to get something, is there a, is there a different way we can do this? Well, um, the Vectrex at this moment is, is uh, uh, 32 years old. Is that right? That's not right, 33. <laughs> I'm off by a decade there. <laughs> um, okay, it's even older. <laughs> so, um, uh, but my point is, it only has an 8-bit bus at 1.5 megahertz. And 1.5 megahertz may sound like much, but is it really nowadays? I mean, um, uh, we 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 have got microcontrollers that, uh, like in, for example, I can get an, an an AVR that actually is is like in 15 times uh, as, as quick, and I can get it for a, a euro. So isn't there, there anything interesting we can get that can keep up with that bus speed? Well, the answer is, yeah, of course there is. Um, I uh, basically looked around on DigiKey, and uh, this is a chip I found, and it's a, a nice uh, uh, ARM Cortex uh, uh, M4 uh, processor, which runs at a blazing 100 megahertz. Some of you probably, well, most of you probably have had computers that weren't that, that, weren't that, uh, uh, that quick. Um, it also has an, uh, uh, yeah, and, 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 and it's really cheap. It's like in seven euros a, a piece. Um, okay, uh, the complete specs are, are this. Um, uh, as you can see, it's, it's 100 megahertz and 32-bit. Uh, um, it actually has uh, uh, an, uh, an FPU, so you can natively do flo f floating point uh, um, instructions. It has a whopping 265 um, a case of flash and, and 128k of, of RAM. And if you consider a normal Vectrex cartridge is 4, 8, maybe 16k, um, uh, then that's, that's quite a lot. It also has USB because you get that almost for free nowadays. And of course it has lots and lots of GPIO pins. So, um, of course, now I want to build the flashcard using this. Well, what do I want? What do I need to buy uh, before I can, can, can make a, a flashcard? Well, of course, I want the chip itself. Um, I also want to have a USB connector because it's in there anyway and I can use it to program the chip without actually needing an external programmer, so that's pretty useful. Um, I also want some flash. Of course, the thing has um, uh, half a K of internal flash but I want to store like in every single Factrex game that has been made for it, so that's not enough. No, I need more. Um, and of course, I also need some power for the, uh, 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 for the processor because nowadays most, most parts this quick are 3.3 volts, so I need a regulator to, to, to um, yeah, I need some logic to, to uh, make the 5 volt Vertrex, Vertrex, Vectrex um, interface with the processor. So this is my quickly drawn uh, um, uh, block uh, schematic. As you can see, um, I've got a, uh, um, this is the uh, cartridge um, connector, which has 5 volt, uh, which I feed into a 3.3 volt uh, regulator for the, um, uh, for the Vectrex itself. Uh, the address lines and uh, an extra line that's also sometimes used as an address line uh, plus a handshake line are, are fed into the um, processor directly. And underneath there's the, uh, uh, the eight data lines that um, also need to go the other way. And 
Um, I, I assumed I wouldn't be able to just hook those up directly, but um, um, uh, in the end it seemed like um, the Vectrex and the SDM actually can uh, talk to each other without needing a level converter in between. So I could have left that out, but I only noticed after I, I, I uh, had all the chips and built uh, the PCB. And, um, well, of course, there's a small uh, crystal, and because I want to store every single uh, Vectrex game, I need a huge, whopping, gigantic amount of 16 whole megabytes of storage. Total cost of that chip is 150, I think. So, um, uh, well, I designed a PCB in uh, GEDA uh, -E PCB. That thing is not made to, to be pronounced. And I sent it off to China, uh, to, to, China to, to uh, uh, let it uh, uh, get manufactured. And I got a few back and I populated them. And uh, well, this is the end result, uh, the, the back and the front. Uh, so uh, just to show you what's where, um, well, uh, on the, uh, actually this is the back. You have the mini USB connector, you have a 3.3 volt um, uh, um, uh, low drop uh, regulator. Of course, in the middle you have the, the uh, processor itself. Then there's the level converter which I botched in. And uh, that's, uh, oh, and there's a, a yellow uh, jumper here which looks pretty large, but that's because the cartridge is pretty small. Like in, I have it here. It's not that big. Um, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a jumper where you can switch it to programming mode. So if you plug in the USB connector, uh, then you can reprogram the uh, uh, microcontroller. And on the other side, there is an 8 megahertz crystal. There's the 16 whole megabytes of flash, huge chip. Um, and there's a NOR gate I seem to need. Well, as you, as you can see, there are a <laughs> fair fair amount of botches here, um, uh, some of them because I made this uh, printed circuit board in a hurry because I wanted to send it uh, along with some other PCBs I, I, I needed to get ma manufactured and partially because of oversights. Okay, the botches, uh, basically there are a few wires that are uh, hardware optimizations. Um, uh, in the end, it, it, it ended up to be um, uh, more uh, useful in software to route every uh, address line to one GPIO port instead of just put them, putting them all over the place. Um, then there's the question of, this, uh, of the end card pin, which is a pin um, on the cartridge connector of the Vectrex. And if you look at all the documents, you see this pin, and it's really handy because it actually goes low as soon as the Vectrex wants a byte from the cartridge, specifically from the cartridge. So that's something you can really easily use if you try to build something like this. Unfortunately, no actual produced cartridge ever used it, and in the later versions of the Vectrex, they just uh, decided not to not to implement it anymore. So I happily made my made my printed circuit board, plugged it in, and it did nothing. And then I went and measured the signals, and well, there was just nothing on this line. Luckily, you can uh, emulate the signal by uh, norring two other signals together, and hence the uh, uh, the gate that's botched in. Uh, of course, there are some stupid design things like in routing the crystal to the wrong pin and stuff like that. And finally, it's only, um, only, only, um, uh, well, it's only aesthetical. Uh, the card actually is upside down. You would expect the bit with, with uh, um, the, the, the processor and the uh, USB port, etc., uh, on it to be the top. It's not. It's the bottom. And you can actually plug it in both ways. You shouldn't, but you can. So that's not really nice. Well, um, uh, as you can see, I built this and uh, I made some initial software. Uh, I, I, I very quickly and dirtily just hacked in a test cartridge, like in a, a huge array in the code somewhere, and just to see if it would work. And well, basically it did. Uh, this is a test cartridge. This is actually the official test uh, uh, cartridge, which actually shows that my Vectrex uh, monitor is pretty well aligned. Um, but well, the most important bit was that it actually ran. So, well, uh, happy. Okay, but now I just have one, um, um, uh, uh, one, one cartridge that I can put in and I can only exchange that by re, uh, recompiling the code that's not useful. So I need a multi-card. Uh, how do I do it? Well, first of all, I need a way to put in the ROMs because as you saw, the, uh, the thing has a flash chip. 
and I can't just put it in a, 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 a yeah, I can't just solder it out, put it in a program, or solder it back in, etc. Every time I want to try a new revision of a game or something. Well, luckily, uh, the chip has uh, USB, and um, there is a library for the uh, microcontroller I have, which is open source, and which has a mass storage driver. And a mass storage driver basically is something you um, uh, you implement, and um, it'll talk. Uh, to the USB port for you, and it just tells any computer that's attach, uh, attached, hey, uh, there's a USB stick or some other storage connected to this. The only thing you need to do is point it to a block device and say, okay, um, uh, if you want to write a block, uh, you can do it using this, and if you want to read a block, here's a function to do that. Well, it actually had a bug which I needed to solve first, which was pretty irritating because you expect code like that to be working. But in the end result, I had a, uh, a flash drive that was pretty slow and uh, only had 16 megabytes of flash on it, but I could actually format it and I could just put files on it. For example, vectrex ROMs. Well, of course, um, um, uh, to, the, to the ARM, um, uh, the, the, uh, the flash still is just a block device. It's a, it's a bunch of blocks. So I need something to interpret that data into files and directories, etc. Luckily, uh, some Japanese dude uh, has written a pretty awesome library for, for that uh, 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 FAT file system. And, uh, well, if you ever need to do something like this, I, uh, this, I, I could advise you to take a look um, uh, at his code because it's very clean and it's very portable. Well, of course, a library isn't all I need. I needed some more code. Um, and this is basically the workflow I decided um, uh, yeah, uh, for everything to have. First of all, I needed the ARM to just look at the flash and uh, load an initial menu game. Um, then uh, the ARM would uh, just read out the contents of the directory where you can put all the ROMs and just compile a nice list uh, of every ROM that's, that's on the flash file system. Um, uh, then it would put that somewhere in the memory of the Vectrex and also put the menu game in the memory of the Vectrex. So the Vectrex can actually run those two things so it could show a nice menu list. Um, uh, finally, of course, the user selects a ROM and um, the Vectrex informs uh, the ARM processor, hey, uh, the guy shows a ROM, uh, you, you, you need to load that and I'll reset and, and then the user can, can play the game. So, well, that's basically the workflow, and I implemented it, and, uh, well, this is how it looks. Um, as you can see, all the, all the names have the .vec uh, extension, and that's because they're basically files on the flash uh, uh, drive. And you can select one, it's not easily visible here, but one of them is, is, is bolder than the other. It's actually more uh, intense, uh, lighter than the other. And, uh, well, you can use that to just select any cartridge and play it. Uh, some of you who uh, uh, actually sat behind my Vectrex may have seen this. Um, so, I have a multi-card. I'm happy. And it's, it's, it, it actually has pretty innovative technology. As far as I know, there have been some efforts to make a quicker microcontroller um, talk to older hardware. But I don't think anyone ever has gone as far to actually implement a complete uh, FAT, FAT file system and use that. But the end result isn't. We still have got exactly the same um, uh, type of menuing system, etc., um, uh, uh, as we had if I would have used an old school flashcard. So let's try and do something interesting. Well, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we've got heaps and heaps of storage. 16 whole megabytes. I can't stress how much that is. 